Our New Testament reading tonight comes from the Gospel according to John. We're looking at chapter 3. Everybody's favorite passage, right? If you go to a football game on the Lord's Day, what are you going to see there? On the, you'll be holding up the sign that say John 3.16. What do you see on the players' cheekbones as they're breaking the Sabbath? John 3.16. Right? Isn't that beautiful? Most people don't like to go to verse 17, though. We will tonight. John 3, 16 through 21. The Gospel according to John, chapter 3, verses 16 through 21. Hear now the word of the Lord as he speaks through the apostle John. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. This is God's holy and inspired word. Now, when you put these two very different passages together, Genesis 2, 15 and following, Genesis, or excuse me, John 3, 16 and following, Genesis 3, 15, or Let's start over. Genesis 2.15. There's too many 15s and 16s around here tonight. Genesis 2.15 and following, wherein God says, do this and live, do this and die. And then John 3.16 and following, wherein God says, believe in the Son of God and live. Don't believe in the Son and you're already dead. What we see in these two passages are two covenants juxtaposed. One is by works, do this and live, and one is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Believe and live. The covenant of works, the covenant of grace. You either do all of the works of the law perfectly and live, or you trust in the one who has done them all, and by grace through faith in him, you are graciously saved. Tonight, as we consider saving faith, our topic is the principal acts of saving faith. As we confessed earlier, the principal acts of saving faith are accepting receiving and resting in Christ alone for our salvation, our justification, our sanctification, and eternal life by virtue of the covenant of grace. The principal acts of saving faith, accepting, receiving, and resting in Christ alone for salvation, for justification, sanctification, and eternal life by virtue of the covenant of grace. That's our topic. And we're going to work backwards. We're going to start at the beginning, and that is with the covenant of grace. And then we'll consider the principal acts of saving grace, and then we'll meditate upon what we receive through faith. That is our salvation, justification, sanctification, and eternal life. You can see here on page 17, the covenant of grace, the principal acts of saving faith, and what we receive through faith. So let's begin with the covenant of grace. What is it? Well, in order for us to properly understand the covenant of grace, we first have to read Genesis 2 and 3. Well, we already did that, didn't we? So what happened? God placed Adam in the garden, and there he covenanted with him. And you might say, well, where did it say covenant? I read that. I was listening. I didn't see the word covenant at all. 
Well, it doesn't have to say covenant. If I say to you, it's big and it's gray, it has big, huge ears and a trunk and tusks, you'll probably know that I'm talking about an elephant, right? I don't have to say elephant. If I describe all the things that an elephant is, you know that I'm talking about an elephant. Well, same with the word covenant. It may not appear here in Genesis 2, but if the elements of a covenant are there, then what do we have? A covenant. Not to mention, in the prophet Hosea chapter 6, verse 7, he says that Adam broke God's covenant. And as our confession teaches, the first covenant made with man was a covenant of works wherein life was promised to Adam and in him to his posterity upon condition of perfect, perfect, you hear that, perfect, and personal obedience. Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 7, paragraph 2. It takes obedience, doing the works of the law. And if you're really interested in this, we did a whole sermon on this probably a year and a half ago. On the covenant of works, which, by the way, is sometimes called the covenant of life. Why do you think? Because life was promised therein. Through works, Adam could receive eternal life for himself and for his posterity. Now, the first covenant, because it's a covenant, came with stipulations, blessings, and curses. That's what all covenants have. All covenants have Stipulations, blessings, and curses. Whether it's your marriage covenant or it's your HOA, CCNRs, covenants, codes, and restrictions, or it's the covenant that you made when you took out a loan, or it's ancient Near Eastern covenants such as the ones we see in the Bible. Covenants come with stipulations, rules that you have to follow, and Blessings and curses. Blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. Now, with respect to the covenant of works, what were the stipulations? Eat from any tree except for that one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There's your stipulation, right? Now, what was the blessing for obedience? Eternal life for Adam and for his posterity. What about the curse? What was the curse for disobedience? Death for Adam and his posterity. See, Adam didn't just die for himself. He died for us. Thanks, Adam. You know what this is called? Bad news. This is the covenant of works. If you want to learn more about it, there's a book in the bookstore called Sacred Bond. And it's an introduction to the covenant of works. I know some of you have already read it. It's a good book. It's written by Michael Brown and Zach Keel, one of my professors, so you know it's legit. Or if you want something less legit, you can just go back and watch the sermon from last year. Now, the premise of the covenant of grace is Adam's failure in the covenant of works. Because it's so important to get this. And we get this from Romans 5. Okay, Adam failed not only for himself, but he failed for all mankind. Because it's through Adam that sin and death entered into the world. And it's through Adam that we are dead, that we are sinners, that we will die. That's very important. This is the premise of Genesis 3.15, that beautiful gospel promise. Despite the fall into sin and misery and death, what does God do? The proto-euangelion, right? Because you were listening two weeks ago in the morning service, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? The proto euangelion, the first gospel promise. He makes this promise. He says, The offspring of the woman will come and crush the head of the serpent. And how do we know this is gracious? How do we know that this is grace being offered to the people of God? Well, what was the response of Adam? Did he name his wife Death? Or did he name his wife Life? Her name in Hebrew. Hewa, it's not Eve. I know Eve sounds pretty and Hewa doesn't, but you just got to deal with the reality. Her name was Hewa, and that means life. So when Adam named his wife life, it's because life was going to come through her. 
The skull crushing serpent who give, or the skull crushing offspring who crushes the head of the serpent gives life. And so we see in naming his wife life, he believed in the promise of God, Genesis 3.15. And further, in Genesis 3.20, or excuse me, Genesis 3.22, the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife, what? Garments of skins and clothed them. So they were naked, they were exposed, their sin was out there for everyone to see in their nakedness, and what does God do? He graciously covers them with animal skins, because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. This is the beginning of the covenant of grace. What did Adam and Eve do to earn these animal skins? What did Adam and Eve do to earn that Genesis 3.15 promise? Nothing. Their sin was the only thing that they did. You see, that's why it's by grace. Now, in the covenant of grace, what's the stipulation? It's really simple. Belief. Because if you don't believe, you're dead already. That's what John just told us, didn't he? God sent his son into the world that by believing in his son, we would have life. But if you don't believe, guess what? You're dead already. You see that? So the stipulation is, it's really, it's really simple. Belief. Faith in the promise of God. This leads to life. That life that Adam lost for us is now promised by grace through faith in the skull-crushing offspring of the woman. And we see this not only in Genesis 3.15, but we see this, the covenant of grace goes from Genesis 3.15 all the way until Christ returns. Did you know that? The covenant of grace begins at Genesis 3.15, and it doesn't end until Christ returns, when the new creation begins. There it is again. I just really need to leave that way, don't I? So we see this in the historical, biblical covenants. What are some of them? Well, the covenant with Abraham, right? Abraham believed, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Genesis 15, 6. There's... There's an important reason why it says Abraham believed. Why do you think? Because the stipulation of the covenant of grace is faith. Abraham believed and it was counted to him as righteousness. Righteousness was imputed to him. Whose righteousness? The righteousness of the Christ to come. Abraham believed and it was imputed to him as righteousness. What about the Mosaic covenant? It seemed like there was a lot of works in there. Well, there were, but it's through the types and the shadows it's through the promises and prophecies, the temple and the priesthood, the Passover lamb, the circumcision. It's through these things that Christ was exhibited in, with, and under all of these old covenant signs, types, and promises. And that means the old covenant believer under the Mosaic covenant who saw these things happening before their eyes, if they believed that they were saved through them, then really they were looking to Christ because he is the substance of, of the Mosaic Covenant. He's the substance of the Old Covenant. He is what was truly promised and exhibited and typified. And that's why Habakkuk says in the Old Covenant, the righteous shall live by faith. We see this in the New Covenant made in the blood of Jesus. As he himself said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for the many. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe. By faith in the Son of God and His work, whether promised through types and shadows, promises and prophecies in the Old Covenant, or exhibited in the New Covenant by His incarnation, by His perfect life, in His atoning death, in His resurrection, by His ascension, in His enthronement, it is by grace that we are saved through faith in the covenant of grace. As Paul famously says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God so that no one would boast. In the covenant of grace, God has done the work. He sent his son, and whoever believes in the son has life. Whoever doesn't, see, here's your blessing and curse. Believe, and you have life. Don't believe, you're condemned already. 
This is the covenant of grace. And from Genesis 3.15, Genesis 15 and 17, Genesis 49, Exodus, 2 Samuel 7, Jeremiah 33, and in the new covenant, the blood of Christ shed for the taking away of all of your sins. It's always by grace, through faith in Christ. This is the covenant of grace. In the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, how were they saved? By their works? No, by faith. What happened when, when we had the opportunity to be saved by our works, to inherit eternal life through our works, what happened? Death. We failed. That time's done. If you want to try it through works, go ahead. I'm not willing to do that. Now, it's not that our works don't matter. Our works, as we read in John, still do matter. Our good works that we do, living in obedience to God's commandments, just proves who we are in. We are in Christ. But we are saved by faith. You can't earn it. That sounds too easy, though, doesn't it? What does grace mean again? I forgot. Unmerited, demerited, undeserved favor. So if it sounds too easy, you're getting it. You're getting it. But you still have to believe because there's a stipulation. It's not just for everyone. See, when it says the world, some people say that and say, well, it's about, it's about quantity. Everyone's going to be saved this way. Well, actually, that's more about quality. It's offered to everyone, but you have to do something. You have to believe. You have to have faith. God sent his son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So it's not for everyone, is it? It's only for those who believe, who trust in him who have true saving faith. And that's what we've been talking about now for several weeks, saving faith. What is saving faith? Well, that brings us to our second consideration tonight. Saving faith, and we're looking at the principal acts of saving faith. Don't you like that? The principal acts of saving faith. Well, what are they? The principal acts of saving faith are accepting, receiving, and resting upon Christ alone for salvation. These are the principal acts. Accepting, receiving, and resting. First, accepting. Now, when you hear accepting, I don't want you to think of the Southern Baptist preacher saying, you need to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. You need to accept him and have a relationship with him. You need to accept him. Because the divines aren't using it in that way. They're using it in the sense of assent, which is the reform way of talking about faith. Assensus, meaning assent, assenting to the truth of the gospel. Not your work of accepting Jesus into your heart, have a relationship. This is a work of the Spirit, wherein through the preaching of the word, the Spirit works to give us new hearts and new minds that we would assent to the truth of the gospel. Assent. And in fact, that's exactly how the larger catechism talks about these principal acts of saving faith. Instead of accepting, it actually says, assenting to the truth of the gospel promise. Westminster Larger Catechism 72. Faith is a saving grace. Wrought, that means worked in the heart of a sinner, by what? By our hard works? By our obedience? No, by the Spirit and Word of God, whereby being convinced of our sin and misery and the disability of ourselves and any other creature to recover us out of our lost condition, not only assent to the truth of the promise of the gospel, but receiveth and resteth upon Christ and his righteousness held forth in the gospel. You see that? Same three terms, but here it's assenting, receiving, and resting. So when the divines wrote this in the 1640s, they didn't foresee the Southern Baptist preacher saying, you need to accept him as your Lord and Savior, Jesus, relationship time. No, they're talking about the Reformed definition of faith, assenting to the truth of Christ, that Christ has come. He lived for you. He died for you. He was raised for you. He ascended for you. And he is sitting on the throne in heaven for you. You need to assent to the truth of Christ. Receive him as he is offered in the gospel. 
receiving him. Is that an active word or is that a passive word? Receiving. That's a passive word. That's why Martin Luther said, faith is the open hand of the beggar that receives the gift. And faith is often connected with receiving the Holy Scriptures, not our doing and working, but receiving. For example, John chapter 1, verse 12, whoever received him, God has given the right to become children of God, even to them that have believed in his name. Receiving and believing are tied together. Acts 10, 43, as Peter preached, Jesus of Nazareth, all of the prophets have borne witness to him that he who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. You hear that? Believing and receiving, they're tied together. Believing and receiving. Because receiving is what happens when you believe. You receive the forgiveness of sins. And not only assenting and receiving, but what else? Resting. There's another passive word, isn't it? Resting. Working? Doing? Nope. Wrong covenant. That was in the garden. Working and doing, that was in the garden. It didn't work out so good. This is resting. And we see this when the gospel is preached and the apostles say, believe on Christ. Rest on Christ. And you will be saved. As I said to the Philippian jailer, when he asked, what can I do to be saved? Acts 16, 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, you and your household. Promises for you and your offspring. So resting on Christ, on his perfect work, on his perfect law keeping, on his payment for sin, on his resurrection. As our Lord Jesus himself said, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Rest upon Christ and Christ alone. That's the stipulation of the covenant of grace. It's quite different from the covenant of works, isn't it? In the covenant of grace, it's about trusting in Christ and Christ alone. It's about assenting to the truth of the gospel, receiving him as he has offered, and resting upon him and him alone for salvation, as the divines say, for our justification, sanctification, and eternal life. And that brings us to our final point, the final part of our thesis. In the covenant of grace, we assent to the truth of the gospel. We receive Christ as he is offered. We rest upon him and him alone for what? For our justification, sanctification, and eternal life. Well, that's a lot of stuff, isn't it? That's like the whole life. That's like all of our salvation. So here, the teaching is that we are justified by grace through faith. This isn't a surprise because we've already done a chapter on justification and we know this is true. It means that since Christ has worked for our salvation, since he did what Adam failed to do in the garden, what Israel failed to do in the wilderness, and what we fail to do every day, he obeyed God's law perfectly. He came under the covenant of works and he fulfilled it for us, thus by his perfect righteousness. And not only that, but by his death wherein he paid for his sin... No, he paid for our sin. So he's the one who fulfills the law, and yet he takes the punishment upon himself. Because the punishment for sin is what? Death. Genesis 2, 17. So not only was Jesus perfectly righteous, but he also paid the price for sinners. Doesn't seem fair, does it? Well, that's the covenant of grace. Too good to be true. It's God's undeserved unmerited, even demerited favor. And we are the beneficiaries of something that we didn't earn, that we could never earn, that we don't deserve through faith. That's the covenant of grace. Covenant of works, do this and live. Covenant of grace, 
I will do this for you. All you need to do to have life is believe. Justified by grace through faith, declared righteous legally in the courtroom of God, forensically. And that's because he worked our salvation for us. As Paul says in Galatians 2.16, we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus. Why, Paul? In order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. We already tried that. And we know that by works of the law, no one will be justified. We are justified through faith. And not only that, but he brings our salvation to completion through the same, through faith. That which he began in us, Philippians 1.6, he will bring to completion. Who will bring it to completion? We do it on our own? Nope. It's through faith in Christ. We are sanctified through faith. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. He doesn't leave us on our own, 1 Corinthians 1.8, but he will sustain us to the end so that we would be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he does this through ordinary means, doesn't he? As we already saw in previous weeks, he does it through the ministry of the word and the ministry of sacraments and prayer. He increases our faith and he enables us to die to our sin and conforms us to the image of Christ and true righteousness and holiness. What's that called? Sanctification. And that is by grace through faith. It's, one of, it's the double benefit. Listen to this. It's the double benefit of the covenant of grace. The duplex, here it comes, Latin, the duplex beneficium. What's the duplex beneficium of the covenant of grace? Justification and sanctification. You don't just get one, you get them both for the price of one. And who does the work? God. Repent and believe. What's the stipulation? Faith. Do you believe? There you go. Now prove it with your life. That's what John says, isn't it? Don't walk in darkness. Don't act like you're dead. Obey. Show, show us that you believe by the way you live. The light has come into the world, but people didn't like the light, so they hid from it. No. Show that you believe through your works. He is the one who brings our salvation to completion. And in this way, by grace through faith, what do we receive at the end? Eternal life. Indeed, as we heard from John for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That means we don't earn our justification, we don't earn our sanctification, and we certainly don't earn eternal life. But Christ did. The offspring of the woman who by virtue of the covenant of grace saves us through faith concerning which the principal acts are Accepting, receiving, and resting upon Christ alone for our salvation, our justification, our sanctification, and eternal life. And I'm going to close with this from Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 7, paragraph 3, because it does a nice job of summing everything up, hitting all the points. Man, by his fall, having made himself incapable of life by the covenant of works, Yet the Lord was pleased to make a second commonly called the covenant of grace, wherein he freely offered unto sinners life and salvation by Jesus Christ, requiring of them faith in him that they may be saved, and promising to give unto all those that are ordained unto life his Holy Spirit in order to make them willing and able to believe. Thus, Saving faith.